Lenin has met Yoko Ono from the old Fluxus days. In 67, of course, it's Summer of Love uh, in San Francisco, and it's also when the Beatles release what has been considered the most influential album in rock and roll, being Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. On the cover, all sorts of artistic influences and celebrities, including Karl Heinz Stockhausen. And the whole album, in a sense, is part of that reinventing of oneself, which has happened so often in artistic cycles and circles. So you had really the, the early Beatles, the lovable mob tops, several years, and then the introspective folk rockers, and now the psychedelics. And in Sgt. Pepper's, it's really a compendium of everything they've done and what they're going to be doing. Influences galore. And we can only touch on a few. How about the drugs with Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds? What key is it in? It's in 3-4 and in 4-4. Four, four. Of course, the LSD, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Lennon just asserted that it was his son's picture of on the refrigerator of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. It's kind of funny looking at all these charts because the Beatles were actually very proud of the fact that they didn't read music. That was for others. Of course, that's why they had George Martin around to do all the heavy musicological, music theory, arranging, lifting, and why he probably gets the award for being the fifth Beatle. By 67 also, Brian Epstein has died, drugs. He felt like in the last couple years of the success of the Beatles that he had been marginalized in some sort of way. When he died, John Lennon felt that it was going to be curtains for the group because he had provided such a unifying force for them. He was the one that initially encouraged them to be more professional, and now look where they've come. Right, it's in D. And so notice that chorus. Oh no, it's in G when it comes around. Do, 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 ti, la, so, fa, mi, re. Notice how close it is to do, ti, la, so, fa, mi, re, do. One would never have any clue that Joy to the World and Lucy in the Sky <laughs> were the exact same solfege. Talk about the importance of rhythm. But now our featured piece. It's the end of Sgt. Pepper's. We're talking a day in the life. Ambiguous lyrics. Ambiguous everything. Now, ah, there it is. Actually, again, it starts in G major. This is actually true of other popular acts at the time, that such care is being taken with every song, every moment of the song, every miking possibility, everything to be special and unique, and really making popular music truly part of musical art. So in one five-minute song, we have as many allusions to other stylistic modes as one could ever want. And of course, the whole album set up as a nostalgic tour. It was 20 years ago today that Sgt. Pepper taught the band to play. They've been going in and out of style, now, but guaranteed to raise a smile. And so that kind of framing technique, and then the rest of the album unfolds, and you have English ballads, ragtime, generic classical music with a harp in She's Leaving Home, an Indian piece, but we'll get to that with George Harrison. George hardly got to be featured, or Ringo. So the songs we've been dealing with here have been basically the Lennon songs. But the middle, eight, so in Day in the Life, starts really as a folk rock. Yes, yeah, so that harmony at the beginning, very clever. May one, and a three, one or six, fifth relationship, third relationship, major four, major two. But we know that major two is really the subdominant of six. And that's both traditional and blues. Discounting the three chords, something else is happening. Two. Astounding, that's the same as Leonard Bernstein, right? With the uh, Second movement of Chichester Psalms. Melody up top. Mi, so, mi, la, mi, so, la, mi. Three pitches. Artless simplicity. I think we have more to tell with the harmony. 
Just any bass line. Do ti la so fa mi re la ti do. Nice. The quartet from Rigoletto has something similar. But in the opposite direction. So it's really an ABA piece. The B section is totally by Paul McCartney. They had the A by Lennon, and the words are terribly elliptical. From the, the innocence of the early Beatles, the obviousness and the innocence of the early Beatles, too. The introspection of the folk Beatles, too. The downright wonderful ambiguities of the late Beatles. The studio band. Rich, famous, they can do whatever they want, including hiring a full symphony orchestra. And with the influence of Yoko Ono, from her fluxus days, her knowledge of John Cage, etc., they do a complete, wonderful, aleatoric, indeterminate move to get the whole symphony orchestra, and they ask them to play from their lowest notes to the highest notes, each individual, almost a Penderecki kind of conception. And as they wiggle up, the B section. And the B section take a little drugs, best I could do with a hookah. And I went into a dream, brass fanfare, all arranged, orchestrated, composed, no doubt, at part. The Beatles as hummers or demonstrators at that, at this point. And then back to the A idea. And then I'd love to turn you on again. And another build up. And the final, to show you that we're really a guitar band. The world's fattest E major chord, which is, of course, E's the lowest note on both guitar and bass. And resonating forever. Yeah, man. In February of 1968, the Beatles went to Maharaji Mahesh Yogi's ashram in India, where they wrote much of the double album called The Beatles, which is known by many people as The White Album. Again, very eclectic, but by now, the four Beatles are really moving in their own directions. When they returned to England, many of the tracks were recorded separately, each of the musicians coming at a different time to lay down their tracks, often starting with drums or bass, and then laying a dysfunctional group Although the end of side one does have a piece that was truly collaborative and has indeed been considered one of their favorite songs, completely eclectic, Happiness is a Warm Gun. This was actually not conceived until they had returned. John saw an article that said, Happiness is a Warm Gun, parodying Charles M. Schultz, Happiness is a Warm Puppy. And it is no less than three songs, perhaps five, strung together, multiple meters, reflecting not only avant-garde Western music, but also that additive tradition that so excited Philip Glass as well, which we associate with Indian music. And the third, or fifth, depending on the point of view, final section is that classic, whoops, please Mr. Postman progression, as... is done very much as a parody of a 50s rock and roll song so it's very self-aware and there are so many influences on the white album we couldn't begin to start but we will say that by this point Yoko Ono is very much in the mix indeed in that same year 1968 Lennon's first wife Cynthia was surprised to arrive home and find that Yoko Ono was wearing her robe and she showed up at the studio and was an important part of the recording process, which violated the Beatles' previous pact of not having wives or girlfriends in the creative process. And indeed, the penultimate cut, Revolution 9, is almost exclusively a John and Yoko work, which is in the tradition of 
Edgar Alvarez, and any composer who has dealt with music concrete, of course the minimalists as well, Terry Riley and Steve Reich. And this is a found collage, but much more rhythmic than one would expect on the classical side, but does dovetail with minimalism and has been considered by many either the greatest Beatles song or the worst. And within two years of the issuing of the White Album, which received high critical respect by and large, although not as universal as Sgt. Pepper's, and indeed is much more violently almost eclectic, humorously so as well. A magnificent work, rivaling the earlier album. But two years after this album, the Beatles break up. And it turns out the sum was greater than the parts, in that while all of them did achieve fame on their own, there was a certain magic in the chemistry of the Fab Four when all was said and done. Lennon, of course, dying ten years later by a bullet from a gunman outside of his residence at the Dakota Hotel facing Central Park in New York. So in that legacy of composers dying far too young, what would have been the continuing legacy? Tomorrow never knows. We have to let it be there.